Welcome to this series of lessons about open channel flows. Open channel flows are among the more important and complex problems in hydraulics. The key difficulty lies in the fact that the boundaries are not fixed as in pipe flows. Indeed, the water level and hence the water depth is one of the unknowns of the problem. In this context, we will discuss the different types of open channel flows listed here and finish with some applications. Let us start with the definition of the problem at hand. As just explained, the water level is one of the unknowns of the problem. So the variables we are interested in when looking at the flow in the stream are the discharge Q and the water depth H. The water depth is particularly important. For navigation, a minimum depth is required. But in case of floods, a too important water depth causes inundations and potential damages to infrastructures. We will make some assumptions before deriving the flow equations. First, we will consider only steady flows. This means that all variables will be constant in time. Then, the flow will be considered as continuous, without any gains or losses so the discharge will be constant all along the stream. Then a river usually looks like illustrated here. The course is meandering and the cross sections present a deeper part at the outer side of meanders. As we are going to consider only a one-dimensional problem along the river axis, we need to define this axis. Instead of selecting the central axis, we will rather consider the tailwag, that is the line joining all the deepest points in the cross sections. This one-dimensional approach implies that we will consider that the water level is constant over a cross section and thus neglect all variations of the flow in the transverse direction. The distances will then be measured along this tailwag with the, the red axis here. S for the abscissa and H for the water depth that is measured perpendicular to the bed. However, if the bed slope changes along the course of the river, it will often be more convenient to work with the blue axis here. The distances are measured along the X axis and the water level is given by the free surface elevation measured along the Z axis. For small bed slopes, until about 10 degrees, the differences between the two systems will be negligible. Then an important assumption is that of parallel flow. This can be explained by an analogy with pipe flows. In pipe flows, if the flow is assumed to be parallel, the piezometric head H equal Z plus P over gamma is constant over the cross section and the pressure distribution is hydrostatic. The head, or energy level in the cross section, is defined as follows, with V being the mean velocity in the pipe. If we consider an open channel flow, assuming also a parallel flow, the free surface becomes the piezometric line. Assuming also that the velocity is uniformly distributed over the cross section, the head in a cross section can also be defined with the same equation here. The head loss J12 is then just the difference of head between the two cross sections here and here. As the piezometric head is constant over the cross section and considering a zero effective pressure at the free surface, the head in a cross section of the open channel flow can be written like this where the level Z is now the level of the free surface. And according to the parallel flow assumption, the pressure distribution in the flow is hydrostatic. So, assuming a parallel flow results in considering that the pressure distribution is in the flow is hydrostatic. The flow will be also considered as turbulent which implies a large Reynolds number above 10 to the power of 6. The definition of the Reynolds number is recalled here. 
where the pipe diameter is replaced by the hydraulic radius defined as the ratio between the wetted area and the wet perimeter of a cross section. So it has the dimensions of a length and it can be considered as representative for the water depth. It is at least of the same order of magnitude. For open channel flows, considering that the viscosity of water is very small, if the depth is of the order of the meter and the velocity of the order of one meter per second, which are realistic values, we see that the Reynolds number will be of the order of 10 to the power of six. So this assumption will certainly be valid for most of the flows. Then, as we, as we recalled the Reynolds number, it is useful to introduce also the food number that will be discussed more in details later. It is defined as indicated here and is representative of the effect of gravity forces on the flow. We will see that these forces have a significant effect in open channel flows. So this number will be useful to characterize the different types of flows. So the fundamental assumptions are summarized here. And with these, we will be able to describe and calculate different types of flows. If all the flow variables are constant, we will have a uniform flow. If some flow variables vary in a continuous and progressive way, we will have a gradually varied flow. And finally, hydraulic jumps induce sharp transitions in the flow variables. Let's start with the uniform flow. Besides the fundamental assumptions, some additional elements of definition have to be added. A uniform flow is defined as a flow with a constant water depth, constant wetted area and wetted perimeter, and a constant depth averaged velocity. These assumptions imply that the channel has to be prismatic. Let us consider a uniform flow between two cross sections 1 and 2. We define the bed slope as S0, which is the size of angle phi between the bed and the horizontal. As the water depth is constant, the free surface is parallel to the bed, and SW, the free surface slope, is then equal to S0. Then, as the velocity v is also constant, the energy grade line represented by SF is also parallel to S0 and SW. In order to establish the equation of the uniform flow, we will express the forces exerted on this portion of the flow of length delta S. We first have the weight of the water volume gamma A delta S. As we are interested only in the equation in the flow direction along the tailway, we will consider the component of the weight parallel to the bed. So the weight multiplied by sine phi, so multiplied by S0. Then we have friction forces acting along the whole wetted perimeter P. Remember, we have assumed a turbulent flow. So in this context, the friction losses are proportional to the square of the velocity, as expressed, for example, by Darcy's equation for the head losses in a pipe flow. Therefore, we will express the wall shear stress like this, with k being just a factor expressing the proportionality between tau and v square. Lastly, we have the pressure forces acting on both sides of the considered volume. As the channel is prismatic, the cross sections 1 and 2 are the same, and the water depth is also constant, so the pressure forces on both sides cancel out. Finally, the situation to be considered is this one, and the balance of forces is written like this. In fact, the uniform flow is the result of an equilibrium between a driving force, that is the gravity along the bed slope, and a braking force, that is the friction 
along the bed and the walls of the channel. In equation 1, delta S can be simplified. Then, remembering the definition of the hydraulic radius, we can isolate the velocity as done in equation 2. The first term here is a constant friction coefficient, that is the Chazy coefficient, from the name of this French engineer who worked on the design of navigation canals. Bazin, another French engineer, proposed this formula here to calculate the Chazy friction coefficient. He, indeed, he observed that in the reality, the friction coefficient as expressed in the Chazy formula was in fact dependent on the water depth. So he proposed an expression that is a function of the hydraulic radius and of another parameter m for which some values are indicated here in the table. Manning, who is an Irish engineer, and Strickler, a Swiss engineer, propose other formulations for the Chazy coefficient, also depth dependent. These latter approaches have become the most popular approaches to express the friction in open channel flows. Some values of the Manning coefficient are, are given here in this table. Small values of this friction coefficient imply a smooth channel bed, while large values imply a rough channel bed. For the Strickler coefficient k, it is just the opposite. We see in the expression for the velocity that a high Manning co coefficient will reduce the flow velocity because of the head losses induced by this high friction. The state of the channel walls can also have an influence on the friction coefficient as indicated here. Walls in perfect state have a lower friction coefficient than walls in a bad state with many irregularities. Cohen developed a methodology to estimate the Manning coefficient of a river as a combination of different values. First, the material involved should be identified. Then, the degree of ir irregularity of this material. The variation of the channel cross-section are also considered. Frequent changes in the channel cross-section will induce local head losses that are accounted for by an increase in the friction coefficient. The relative effect of obstructions present in the channel are also accounted for. And the presence of vegetation is another factor that can increase the global friction coefficient, as very high vegetation in the flow can reduce the velocity significantly. Finally, the degree of meandering of the considered channel can also increase the apparent friction coefficient. The presence of meanders will induce several changes in the flow direction that are sources of head losses. This is accounted for by the multiplication factor M5. In real situations, as illustrated here, the friction coefficient can be different on the bed and on the banks of a river. So we need a method to estimate an equivalent friction coefficient if a uniform flow is to be calculated in a prismatic channel with heterogeneous walls. Let us consider the trapezoidal cross-section illustrated here, in which we have different Manning friction coefficients for different parts of the wetted perimeter AB, BC and CD. We can consider that each part of the wetted perimeter has an influence over a part of the cross-section, as illustrated here. The exact limits of these areas do not have to be clearly identified, as we will see. Indeed, according to the assumption by Hans Albert Einstein, the velocities in each subsection are equal, and equal to the cross-section average velocity v. Using the Manning equation for each subsection, equation 1 can be rewritten like this. We can develop the hydraulic radius as the ratio between A and P, eliminate S0 and elevate all the equation at the power 2 thirds in order to obtain equation 3. 
The ratios expressed in the three first terms of equation 3 can be added because the sum of the subsections on the numerators yields the total cross-section A. So, from equation 4, we can isolate N, the equivalent Manning friction coefficient for this heterogeneous cross-section. This can be generalized to cross-sections with any number of heterogeneities, resulting in the equation here proposed by Einstein. As a summary, the uniform flow equation is obtained after a balance of the forces exerted on a portion of the flow. The resulting equation allows to calculate the flow velocity in a prismatic channel with a given slope S0 and a given friction coefficient N, knowing the hydraulic radius that depends on the shape of the cross-section and on the water depth. The equivalent Manning coefficient for a heterogeneous cross-section can be determined using the Einstein equation here. And with this, we finish this lesson. We will see in the next one how to calculate the uniform depth in practical cases. Goodbye!